Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Thinker Thema. I'm Amy and this is my better half, uh, Maggie, and today we are reviewing Marco Polo 2 in the service of the Khan. And this game is a game uh, published by Z-Man Games and it's a power duo of um, a designer couple. Um, no, they're not a couple. <laughs> <That sounds weird. laughs> Okay, wait. <laughs> you heard it first. <laughs> the tea is hot. <laughs> Piping hot. The tea is hot. This is a game that is by a powerhouse duo of designers. We've got Danielle Tassini, who of course is responsible for many of the games in the T series. So Teo Tuhua Khan, uh, Tekenyu, which we recently reviewed and loved. Um, and then you have uh, Simone... Luciani, who was responsible for Grand Austria Hotel, who PS has a Kickstarter coming soon expansion, so exciting. Uh, but the two of them have also been together and created Sulkin, which while it's not one of my favorite games, I can certainly appreciate the complexity and the time element that's built into that game. So these two are no stranger to complex Euro games and um, they're very well loved. Now, Marco Polo is the second in the series. Obviously there was Marco Polo one and we are reviewing Marco Polo two. We actually have never played uh, Marco Polo one for yeah. some reason it's just one of those ones that we're like oh we really should mm. try that and pick up a copy and we just never got around to it and then two was announced and released and we thought well why not start here um, hopefully they've made some improvements to the original game um, so today you know we have an understanding of Marco Polo one and the difference in the rules so we'll talk about that but mostly we'll be focusing on the experience and gameplay of Marco Polo two yeah. So in Marco Polo 2, you are, I would say, versions of Marco Polo, um, trying to please the can as uh, he's decided to say, go west, young man, and you're going west of Beijing via the Silk Road, looking to essentially set up new trading posts, discover new lands, explore, and yeah, fill up contracts along the way. And so the way that you do this is through worker placement, which is, you know, right up there, probably our shared favorite mechanic. Yes. Um, I mean, aside from a rondelle, which, you know, how I feel about rondelles. Yeah. Now, what's interesting and unique about the worker placement in this game is that you don't just have standard workers. No, no, no. You've got your own set of five and they are in the form of dice. And instead of drafting those die, you are rolling them and then using the pips as their power for what worker placement actions you can take around the board. And now the board is split into two main sections. There's the map or the traveling element at the top of the board. And at the bottom end of the board are the more public actions that you're competing over in order to move around the map, for example, in order to access resources and to trade jade, which is a valuable commodity in this game for other sets of resources. Um, you can go to the city cards, which again, have more of an exchange kind of power. So you're trading for victory points or for camels or for different resources and they change round to round. And I think that's really interesting in this game. You've got worker placement spots that are different round to round, not game to game. Mm. And so you never quite know what's coming up or what is going to be available to you. And the final piece of the puzzle is that you've got a worker placement spot where you can collect these guild seals. Guild seals are going to give you a, bon a round bonus that is reoccurring, kind of like an income if you activate them, but they're also going to allow you to take some shortcuts on the map um, where it will be less expensive or quicker for you to take, um, to take that path instead of a more expensive path or longer path. Now, the interesting part is that as you travel around the map portion of the board, you're also unlocking worker placement spots in cities where you place from your player board a trading post. And what's beneficial about that is that you get to take that bonus where other people might not be able to until they've unlocked that city as well. And that's where this game becomes interesting. It's about when you compete for the public available spots versus traveling and unlocking some unique worker placement spots of your own. 
Now, the other unique part of this game is that along the way, you are unlocking the ability in certain cities to collect contract cards. Now, contract cards are your personal objective cards that once you fulfill them with a certain level of resources that you're collecting along the way, you will unlock victory points. It's one of the main ways that you can get victory points in this game. Yep. However, you have to have visited a city that provides you with those contract cards. And I believe that's how this game differs from Marco Polo 1 to Marco Polo 2. My understanding of Marco Polo 1 is that the contract cards were quite separate to the traveling component, whereas here they are very much integrated. You can't just work on contract cards if you haven't unlocked the ability to collect them, and you can't just focus on traveling because so many victory points are tied up in these contract cards. So you're kind of needing to do both. Now, the other interesting part about this is that there are placement spots that can be used by one person only. And then there are placement spots that can be used by multiple people. But if you're second to go in that spot, you have to pay the value of your die. And that is really tricky in this game because money is hard to come by and you need a lot of money to, to travel around the map in the top half of the game. Yeah. Now, without getting into too much more detail about the mechanics of the game, fair to say that everybody starts with a different character mm -hmm. and some of those characters have quite significant abilities that will change the way that you play out this game. The second thing is that everybody starts with a secret objective card, yes. which tells you which cities you, you need to travel to throughout the game to unlock more victory points at the end, as well as the guild seals that you might go after and try to activate along the way. And the final part of this puzzle is that at the end of the game, you're going to get escalating number of points for the number of different types of cities that you've visited. Each city has a different colored shield or symbol, and the more differentiated the cities are that you've visited, the greater the number of points. And really that is key to uh, winning this game because mm. that's a lot of points, um, but also you need to travel to get contract cards. So all of these things are interrelated and potentially the more contracts that you're fulfilling, the less you're able to travel because you're spending um, you know, money and camels. And I, I find it quite a tricky puzzle, mm. actually. I wouldn't say that it's a particularly tight game. And my understanding is that Marco Polo 1 was probably the tighter game in terms of having that um, tension in every decision. This game, I feel as though, I almost feel like I'm competing with myself more mm -hmm. than you. So it's the, the dice spots, there's always somewhere where it feels like you can go, but the real tension comes from your limited resources yes. and how you're going to achieve everything you need to achieve with those limited resources. Um, so it feels more like the game is more punishing towards me rather than the interplay between mm. um, people. And I, and I understand that they have loosened some of the criteria a little bit to give more of that um, kind of point salad, different mm. ways to achieve uh, the end goal. Yeah. Um, but overall, I, I, don't know, I find it like a pleasant game. Yeah, mm. I, I, it actually took me a little while to wrap my head around what's going on because it felt very mechanics wise. It felt very like there were there are a lot of different ways of achieving a similar thing. And so and a couple of times I found myself locked out of any action where I was like, oh, there's actually nothing I feel like I can do right now. Uh, so I'm just going to take a distress type. Um, action. So yeah, I think if you're going to play this, one of the things would be is like give it multiple goes to get a hang of what's going on because there's a lot of different things going on. It's not complicated, but it's not super intuitive. Yeah, I think I think there's just a lot to think about. Um, yeah. It's more like it's not a linear game. You could no. you can go in different directions. Yes. You can try and achieve different things. Um, you're trying to balance off your end goals versus like smaller amounts of points along the way with contract cards. Mm. So I can see that as you introduce more people, um, again, given lockdown, we've only played this as a two player yes. game, but we have played it a lot. And um, compared to other similar games where I felt the tension wouldn't escalate in this one, I feel like it would because uh, with more players, you're going to be forced to pay for your die actions um, more 
um, frequently than you are in a two player game because you're going to be more likely to be the second person to get there. Um, should also note that as you move from city to city, if you're the first one to visit that city, you get a bonus in resources, mm-hmm. an extra contract card, all of these positive type things. If there's more players, you're less likely to get there first because yeah. there's more people traveling around. So I certainly think that it would actually tighten up quite a lot at a higher play account. There's also a disadvantage to some of your unique um, characters because, for example, there's one where you get to take that that bonus or advantage once a player has discovered it uh, and then you get to use that later on. Sometimes in a two player game, if there wasn't a lot of travel, then that person ended up being stuck with, well, this is pretty much a useless ability. Yeah, I mean, there are two characters in this game that I feel um, that with the one that Maggie just spoke about where you're gaining bonuses from what other people are doing, that is severely disadvantaged in a two player game. Yeah. The other one is a character that allows you to travel for free. You can't go as far, you can only go one step at a time, but there are significant savings because you're not paying money or camels. Yeah. And I know like there has been a lot of chatter about this game and that character in particular and whether it's overpowered. It's- And it it is very powerful, but I would say that uh, if you're going to include it in the game, only do so with um, gamers who have played it a number of times Mm -hmm. so they know how to kind of block that skill. Uh, Whereas if you're not actively blocking that person, they are going to get a runaway lead, um, as I did. Yes. (laughs) So let's talk about the theme. Um, I was very excited when I saw a game about Marco Polo, and that's Marco Polo 2, because I was like, I actually don't know enough about Marco Polo. All I know is, you know, when you go to a pool, you go, Marco. Polo. Yeah, there we go. Oh, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's okay. But that's part of the game. I'm sort of trying to figure out. Where. So I was like, great, I'll get to find out uh, a bit more about, you know, what all of that is about. Um, so did I? Did I actually learn about what Marco Polo's life and, uh, and history and journey is? Uh, partially so somewhat from from again it's one of those games where from the from the rule book you get very little uh, indication of what's going on you know that and again I had to kind of go off and do my own research about Marco Polo which I'm very happy with because now I feel like I know too much but I love the rule book because there was no <laughs> there was no yeah no no story <laughs> straight to the point so there's three things that I've, I've learned about Marco Polo one is that he was a merchant from Venice not the merchant of Venice from the Shakespeare play that came later geek alert um, he was a merchant that definitely comes through because probably the bulk of what you're doing is you're just trading yeah you're just uh, you're using your camels and you're exchanging them for silk and for spices or pepper you're using uh, jade as another currency so that comes through quite strongly the second thing was an explorer so marco polo was actually um the the original influencer uh, in the sense of he was one of the not not the first explorer uh not the not the most um a uh, successful explorer, but the third component was he was a writer or a storyteller. So he was the one who actually managed to get it in writing, chronicle the journeys that then inspired the subsequent European um, uh, travelers and explorers like uh, famous or infamous Christopher Columbus, who then went on to discover uh, a lot of things along with a, a lot of other um, uh, yeah, European uh, colonizers or explorers. So the exploring component, does that come across? I would say to a degree you are sort of exploring, you're moving around, but you're not really discovering anything because at a glance, everything is, you can see what you're going to get wherever you go. So I think one element that, I'm not saying that this is what it should have done, it's just for it to be more of an exploring experience, it would mean that I don't know what I'm going to get when I'm going to, when I get to. But that would introduce uh, luck into the game. But potentially, but you also, one of the things that would be happening around this time is a lot of it is you're hearing from all your trading posts and the people that you're coming in contact with what's to be found in that land over there. Mm-hmm. So if you knew, for example, that the contracts and the type of benefits that are going to be there are of a certain type of quality, but you don't know exactly which one or how good it is, then that would be much more thematically like in tune with, like you are discovering, you are exploring, and it's like, oh, it ended up being a dud, or actually that ended up being being really bad but it is in that realm of it's you know it's by sea so I'm expecting that it's going to be this stuff the the thing with the contracts is it doesn't actually matter like you place them wherever so it doesn't really matter where you go it's still the same merchant experience Mm -hmm. Um, the other component is as I said like he was the original like hashtag travel influencer that then like 
excited and inspired all these other people after him. The, the reason for that was that, again, he wasn't the first, he wasn't the, the most successful, he was just the one who documented it, yeah? There's nothing about, like, the, the, it comes through very strongly that he was a very good storyteller. Not only in the way that he documented all his journeys, but also that was why the can loved him so much. Because he was like, he would come back and then hear all the stories of, you know, what did you find over there and what kind of crazy stuff did you come... There's none of that, obviously. Oh, it depends on how... You've got to use your imagination, Maggie. Like, he is traveling and, and picking up... Um, you know, different type. He's visiting different types of cities, yes. and it rewards you for the further you explore and these different types of lands that you uncover. And if you're first to get there, you're also getting a bonus. Which, yes, it's just. But the bonuses are not. They're they're, they're more of the same. Land. So yeah. they're more of the same thematically speaking. Yes. The one thing that I will give it is the the saving grace is the shields. So or the shields, the the mm. symbol for each city. Uh, in the fact that they're unique. So that's probably the hint or the kind of nod of, yes, you know, you, one of the things was he was discovering all these animals that, you know, they didn't have in Europe. So something that sounded like, you know, this is the cross between a unicorn and a pig. And the Europeans were like, mind blown. It's like, it's a rhino. Yeah. So it's like, we know now because we have that. So, so there are like, you know, there's the monkey and there's the serpent and there's the clouds because there was a lot of like some of the stars that he could see or he would report that he saw it's stuff that you couldn't see in Europe. So again, there's a nod to that. Yeah. I just... I, I, the, from a from a themer perspective, <clears throat> do I feel like I'm Marco Polo? I feel like I'm experiencing the merchant side, but the my concern is on replayability. It's still always just going to be more of the same. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not an unpleasant experience. You're getting to do that mm. kind of trade. But stuff. I also think that if the rewards were more mm. closely tied to the city that you're visiting, like what you're describing, being on the coast, you know, might have a different type of reward then the game would actually play out more similarly between games because you would always need to go to certain paths to get certain resources. And at the moment, everything about the setup, and it is quite a tiresome setup, yeah. actually. <laughs> There's a lot of things going on. Um, but when you reveal all of the contracts which can mm -hmm. fall anywhere or all of the bonuses which can fall anywhere, it means that in every game, you're going to have to follow a unique path. And actually, I think if you closely tied reward with city, you would lose some of that variability yeah. in terms of the journey. Yeah. Um, but having said that, so I, the thing with the variability of the journey is mm -hmm. I don't feel like you get that at the moment anyways, because the, the, the exchanges yeah. are all the same. Like there's only those resources and it's only just going to be a combination of those things. Yes. So that's one of the things that I struggle with, with games like this. Like I enjoy, I enjoy that sense of, um, the, the merchant side of it. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're, but you're right. Like it's very solitaire in the sense that I could just focus on, fulfilling as many contracts as I can mm -hmm. uh, and then get my points mm -hmm. that way. But there, I don't really get a sense of creation or that I'm building something beyond that. I'm just fulfilling contracts to have the most victory points because we know that, you know, the Khan needs the victory points. That's the only way he's going to feed his people or something yeah. like that. <laughs> like we, oh, I mean, I completely agree with you. I'm, I don't get a strong sense of the theme here, but, and the, the, I, I almost would always get out, I think, one of these designers' other games before this game. I would agree. Yeah. Uh, um, but for me, that's about the tightness and the competitiveness of yeah. it. Um, and there, like you said, there's a lot of just trading goods for other goods, fulfilling contracts. So it's kind of, it does get a little bit repetitive after a while. Um, transactional. Like yeah, it is very transactional. Yeah. And and it is more solitaire than those other games where there's more player interaction. Mm -hmm. But I, I still enjoy this game. Like if someone was to get this out and set it up for me, yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't have to set it up. Babe. I would go, <laughs> babe, can you, can set, you set, up set it up? Um, While I'm taking a shower. <laughs> if I sit down and everything's set up, you know, I would more than happily play this game. I would love to sit down at a con and play this game with um, a group of four people because I mm. think it would get more competitive. Definitely. And I think if you're playing with experienced players, it, it would be quite a tight competition for, for the different 
in order to achieve what you're trying to achieve, which yeah. is similar in most worker placement games. Um, it's just with other worker placement games, there tends to be more paths to victory yes. um, or more different strategies that mm. you can employ. Whereas here, because they've integrated the contracts with the travel, you need to do both. And yeah. in order to do both, you need to collect resources. And yes. so it always kind of plays out in the same way. Um, but yeah, that's... Would we keep it? Oh, we'll definitely keep it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I'm very keen to play this with some of our yeah the the friends that love the other these other games because I think it's going to be very interesting to see, as you said, that that dynamic once you have more players and you've got like that competition and you're seeing, you know, there were games where I hardly moved um, and I was just kind of fulfilling contracts with a couple of trading posts that I had set in place but i think if you're seeing someone that's moving around a lot it might kind of give you a bit of that envy of like oh i want to do that or yeah, they're getting all those goodies yeah, yeah 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 so I'm, I'm keen to to play it yeah we'd keep it i would say that it's a game for you and you would probably love it if you like those games but feel maybe there are too tight a little bit unforgiving this one is a bit uh more forgiving there's more options for you to do there's always something you can do in terms of collecting resources it has a more pleasant feel less stressed feel about it um so if that is your jam and you you know like more complex games this is complex without being so tight that, and punishing yeah. um yeah but that's our review of marco polo 2 if you liked this review please subscribe to our channel uh, we're very excited to be producing as much content as we can at the moment enjoying as many games as we can while we're in lockdown here in mm, melbourne yeah. Um, so yeah check out our other videos hit like if you liked this one if you've played marco polo one or two and you have some comments please let us know we love to have a chat in the yeah. comments section but otherwise bye for now 